All right, so uh, today we're going to take a look at this uh, Google Developers Training Android Developer Fundamentals. It's apparently version two of the lesson plan. Um, it appears to be a official Google Development Training Team course. Uh, it teaches you basic Android programming concepts. Each lesson has a slide deck of concepts, chapters, and one or more hands-on tutorial exercises. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover all of those things, uh, and then I'll put links to each section uh, in the description so you can kind of skip around. Uh, let's see here. You have to have some Java experience, apparently. So if you don't have any of that, just get out of here right now. Um, it's intended for computer science and engineering undergraduates who have already learned. That kind of blows my mind that uh, you have to be an undergraduate to dive into this. This is intended for you, but, you know, that's fine. That's fine. So we're going to look at lesson one right here. Getting started. Uh, installing Android Studio. Understanding the project structure. Uh, making an app. Testing the app and the support library. Uh, I've done most of these things. I haven't done the support library, so that'll be fun. Um, we're gonna start with our concept slides, I guess. Uh, I'm seeing some repeat information, that's fine. Here's the PowerPoint. I'm uh, starting at the end, apparently. Building your first app, lesson one. Oof. Android is an ecosystem. I love the yeah. We're gonna we're gonna be covering all of these topics. That's why it looks like just a bunch of stray points. Uh, so we're gonna open up with the ecosystem concept. Let's look at that. The Android ecosystem. Um, so Android's based on Linux. Fun fact: o over eighty percent of all smartphones are using Android, which is pretty crazy. Um, user interface for touchscreens. Yeah, I mean, after the uh, iPhone dropped. We stop putting buttons on our phones. We're trying to, you know, as little, as few real physical buttons as possible, which, yeah, that's fine. Uh, watches, TVs, and cars. That's right. Android is not just for your cell phones. Uh, I think I have a, I have one of all of these except for a car that runs Android now, so that's a pretty crazy reality that we're facing. Um, Two million Android apps in the Google Play Store. Two million button clickers in the Google Play Store. So that's, uh... That's pretty cool. Uh, highly customizable for devices by, de by the vendors. Uh, an example of that, you know, you see the, uh, the flagship uh, companies, they'll put out their own uh, flavor of Android. You know, you get your, your, own, uh, your own version of the camera app, uh, and you get your own version of all the other apps. Uh, that's, some people think it's a good thing. Some people don't like particular, you know, uh, flavors of the Android, but... It is customizable. Okay, so uh, user interaction, touch gestures, the virtual keyboard, uh, and support for external peripherals. Uh, that's yeah. We I think we are all aware of this. Uh, sensors, Android and sensors. Uh, you have your um, your orientation sensor, which I believe is just a ball bearing that you know it drops down into a switch so if you're holding it straight up it'll drop down into the straight up switch and then when you turn it it moves I'm not really sure if that's the way it works anymore if they use an accelerometer or something like that but uh, let's see walking adjust position on a map okay so there's your accelerometer uh, tilting same thing uh, moving too fast okay so it seems like these are all about the one sensor but that's uh, I think that's one of the only truly standard sensors you know you have uh i mean you wouldn't call the touch screen a touch sensor i suppose you have a light sensor for the camera i bet uh stuff like that In infrared i know that there are some uh some phones that have an infrared output i wonder if any can receive infrared all right so what else we got uh the android home screen i feel like most people i'm talking to here are aware of how the android home screen operates um, pretty cool uh, if you consider, you know, you have the launcher, which, you know, I have a custom launcher on my Android phone, so you can go ahead and even replace the the Android home screen if you really want to. That can be configured through the, the, um, 
the SDK. That's pretty cool. Uh, some app examples. Um, yeah, no surprises there. <laughs> okay, now we get into the SDK development tools. Uh, you're looking at uh, Android Studio uh, uh, on all of the, the, the tools that come with it. As far as I understand, you could use pretty much any Java IDE to, uh, to work with that. So it's up to you. Libraries, which are like, I don't know, say packages of software that you can use to implement into your program. Uh, they give the examples here, maps. So if you want to, you know, you make a Google app, uh, Google Maps app, you, uh, you can use their, uh, their maps library uh, so that you're not, you know, re reinventing the wheel with respect to the maps angle. Same thing with wearables. You know, it's probably uh, the library has the, the uh, components you need to communicate with uh, Android Wear devices because it's a separate operating system kind of sort of. I don't, I don't want to make a hard claim on that, but they definitely operate in a different way and they have uh, particular uh, notification schemes and things like that that are different than on the standard phone. Uh, virtual devices, yep, that's uh, thrown in with uh, Android Studio. Uh, you can uh, emulate pretty much any phone you want. Uh, documentation, of course, that's a big one. Sample code. Yep. Let's see, here's a look at Android Studio. I'm going to we're going to be doing that. Google Play Store, yep, that's some magic stuff. You publish your apps through it. Uh, we've all been there, I think, trying to find the best clicker app. Uh, Android platform architecture. Oh, look at that. There's the Android stack. If I was a much smarter person, I could talk to you at great length about this. But you can kind of see what's going on. You got your apps up top. This is where we're kind of working. And we're interacting with the uh, Java API framework and then after you get a few layers down you know it gets a uh, it gets a little messy and that's uh, maybe that's why you have to be a uh, undergraduate to uh, to understand this slideshow I suppose uh, let's see what else do we have here system apps system versus user apps so system apps have no special status system apps provide key capabilities to app developers your app can use a system app to deliver an SMS message uh, okay, so um, I'd love. I know that uh, I've seen these apps, uh, you know, on my phone. I'd just love to get uh, the name of a couple. The pre-install. Da, 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 da. Users don't have access to the system apps. Yeah, they're those apps that are built in. You can't you can't remove them. Your phone needs them to function. Um, we're gonna open up that topic later on because there's some interesting stuff going on in there. But I'm not ready for that right now. So moving on. Uh, the entire feature set of the Android OS is available to you through APIs written in Java. View class hierarchy to create UI screens, notification manager, activity manager for life cycles and navigation. So those are some big three. I've been working with the view class hierarchy. I've been working with the activity manager notifications. Haven't dug into it yet, so that'll be an interesting, uh, an interesting angle when we get to that. Uh, each app runs in its own process with its own instance of the Android runtime. Okay. Uh, the core C++ slash C libraries give access to the core native Android system components and services. Ooh, hardware abstraction layer. Some interfaces that expose device hardware capabilities as libraries. Right, so you're working with your camera, your Bluetooth. I think uh, intents are going to play a role in there. I'm not sure. Let's find out. Uh, the Linux kernel, if you're digging that deep, I'm really impressed. Uh, let's see here. They're talking about the versions. I'm going to be using Lollipop because that's what my phone uses. It's depressing to find out I'm on an old version of Android, but I, I pretty much knew that. Uh, you got your new versions. If I had a lick of nuance with that, in terms of that stuff, I'd go into it, but uh, we're just going to have to discover that for ourselves. Uh, what is an Android app? <laughs> All righty. One or more interactive screens. Yeah, I buy that. Written using Java and XML. Okay. Uses the Android Software Developer Kit. 
uses Android libraries and Android. Okay, so they're basically saying if you uh, <laughs> if you make an app for Android using the app for Android tools, you've got an app for Android. I I buy that. Definitely buy that. Challenges of Android development, multiple screen sizes and resolutions. The struggle is real. You cannot simply rely on the ability to put a button a thousand pixels over to the left or to the right on a screen. You, you do not know, you know, absolute values. Every screen's got a different size, their aspect ratios. Uh, so you're going to need tools that help you get around that, that allow you to scale your interface. Uh, pretty much at the drop of a hat, you know, even if I flip my uh, orientation from landscape to, to, uh, to portrait, I'm looking at a completely different screen now, uh, you know, in terms of how, uh, how it operates. If, uh, if my app scrolls from top to bottom and it's very narrow, I go into uh, landscape mode, well, all of a sudden, do I have a bunch of white space? Am I scrolling much further? You know, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of things that are going to change there. Performance, make your apps responsive and smooth. That is a very real thing. Uh, I tried to make a whack-a-mole app without understanding uh, things like surface view. I used a basic view and uh, on draw and invalidate, which uh, it was very slow and painful. And so I had, to, uh, I had to figure out how to make my app more responsive and smooth. Uh, security, whew, what a nightmare. Uh, goes without saying, you gotta be, you gotta be secure. We're seeing uh, left, right, and center data breaches coming out of uh, coming out of applications, online forms, all sorts of things. So you don't want that. Compatibility, what a crazy situation, you know. Uh, you got like 20, 20 some odd builds of Android, and you know they have different features, and new features came in at certain points. Uh, Android is very, be I guess I'm assuming because of the the scale of the problem with Android, they have a lot of tools that help you manage compatibility or at least ensure that you vaguely understand what you're looking at when you pick your build version, you know, how many people are going to be able to actually use this. And uh, when we dig into that support library, we're going to see how they're actually implementing forwards compatibility for certain features, apparently. <clears throat> Marketing. Understand the market and your users. Hint, it doesn't have to be expensive, but it can be. I don't know what that means. I don't like it. Uh, moving on. <clears throat> App building blocks. You have resources. You have components. You have your manifest. You've got your build configuration. Resources, your layouts. That's your UIs, your images. Strings, these are... Um, Constant data, like my app name, it's called Whack-A-Mole. So I actually assign a string, a constant string to be that. So whenever I need my app name, I just go and say strings at name, you know, or uh, app name. Uh, colors as XML and media files. Okay, so components. You're looking at activities, services. These are specific things. An activity is a very specific thing in Android. It's not just like, you know, like the clicker button game. It's, it's a, uh, it's a, component, well, as it says. Uh, helper classes is Java code, okay. The manifest, information about the app for the runtime. The app, that's where you're going to register your, uh, you can change some specific settings about the application. So when it goes to boot up the app, it's like, hey man, I, uh, I have some very specific layout rules. You know, I'm a portrait only application, okay. Uh, you could also have your your um, your activities from before there. The activities that you want to that you want to load up. It's going to contain. It's a manifest of all these things. So it's kind of like the index of your book. You know, uh, if you can imagine a book where <laughs> you need the index to find anything, you can't just flip through it. You need that index. All right. You got to know what which one of the invisible pages you want to go to. So. Uh, Big deal. Uh, and then the build configuration, uh, which I can't speak too greatly about. We're going to learn. Uh, if you want to learn more, there's some links. I don't. What's next? We do the concept chapter. And this is where the meat begins. This is, this is the lecture here that, you know, somebody who's actually educated would be giving you. Uh, they probably have some extra insights to add. I hope I've been able to add a few. We're going to flip over to the actual meat and potatoes of this situation here. Um, so, here it is. This is a chapter 
of, oh, we want the introduction. Oh, uh, maybe we don't. I think that this is what we just went through. So let's see here. Yeah, I should actually just stick to these. And they say it's easy to develop apps. There's your uh, your Android stack. All right. Oh, some descriptions. Yeah, sure. So let's say the how, the hardware abstraction layer. The layer provides standard interfaces that expose device hardware capabilities to the higher level Java API framework. So I mean, I, it kind of sounds like you know you imagine your phone. It's a it's a cluster of components. Yeah, you've got a camera, you've got an accelerometer, you've got uh, your microphone, there's a sensor, you've got uh, your speaker, and um, so the hardware abstraction layer, it sounds like the connection between these devices and uh, the libraries that you're going to be accessing in order to control the devices, okay? So um, it's very important. It's kind of like an interface between two things that can be very different. You know, it can be a it can be a Samsung phone, it can be an LG phone, it can be whatever, but it links to the same libraries, or it can. Uh, I think that's what we're looking at there. <clears throat> Distribution options, yeah. Uh, APKs, you install them. Great stuff. Good stuff. Fun. All the versions. The challenges, okay, so we looked at a little bit of this. Building for a multi-screen world, look at there, right there, you see sizes, different sizes, but the same apps, different, or the same home screen, you know. Uh, getting performance right, yeah, we covered this. Uh, we want to do all these things. We definitely want this. So let's move on to the first Android app. I'm probably going to skip the slideshow and just do these lovely... Uh, uh, info tutorials, I guess we'll call it. So the development process, how do we develop a thing? Uh, you start with an idea and a de definition of requirements uh, that you need to realize that idea. Uh, sketching, oh, classic advice, make some sketches. Uh, and they have a process here. They have a, looks like a six step process. So you create your project in Android Studio. Wow, just jumping right into it all right define a layout for each screen that has ui elements write the code in java build and run the app on real and virtual devices test and debug the app and publish the app so okay and it looks like there's a little loop you know from steps three to five you're gonna write you build you test ah, i screwed up write build you test okay i'm okay with it that sounds about right. Um, using Android Studio, unified development environment for creating apps for all Android power devices. It is definitely a unified environment when you're using Android Studio. I will say that much. It makes it pretty easy to get started. I was a little shocked. Oh, and look at that. There's a tutorial already. They're telling us what to do here. So I'll actually switch over to the real deal. And... Um, you can follow the tutorial. I'm going to do the tutorial, so I think that that's going to be the most helpful. So, you install that Android IDE. You start a new Android project in the welcome window. Boom. Beautiful. Name the project, the same name that you want to use for the app. So, I'm going to say, uh, South College Hello World. Just to, I have Hello World already for a, for a class, so I'm going to keep that around. We're going to do com.saltcallage. Uh, what was this called again? Uh, Android Fundamentals, something like that. ADF, that's what I'm going to call it. So I'm going to throw the ADF in there. .adf, that way I know what's going on. So the company domain, uh, when we pick our company domain, it says it here too. Keep in mind that apps published to Google, Google Play must have a unique package name. Uh, that's what we're looking at here, I do believe. Uh, because domains are unique, prepending the app's name with your name or your company's domain name should provide an adequately unique package name. So they're they're saying that you know when you uh, when you make these apps, they're stored uh, the the source code for them is stored in packages, and those packages have to have unique names. And they use periods, kind of like they use uh, like you would use slashes in a directory structure. 
So that's why I've that that's why you'll see everywhere, not just me, that people use this structure, this something dot something dot something. So just try to keep those unique. You know, you can throw your name in there if you've got uh, you know something that identifies you uniquely. Go ahead, throw that in there. We're not publishing these to the App Store, and this whole package name collision thing isn't going to be too much of an issue for us. But regardless of that, you may as well get into the habit. Uh, it says here, be aware that changing the package name later is extra work. And nobody, nobody likes extra work. Uh, what else do we got? So this is all we need here. Make sure you set an appropriate location, project location, because you're just going to want to do that. And uh, now we get to see here, we're looking at the form factors minimum SDK. So what does this mean? Um, for one, you can see that we're choosing what kinds of Android uh, devices we want to be running. And uh, we're going to stick with phone and tablet. And we're going to choose for a minimum SDK. And I want you to take note of uh, this line under here. It says, how, what percentage of the devices can we run on here? Uh, the tutorial specifies that we go for API 15. So we're going to go for that. I hope I have it installed. Ice cream sandwich, classic. Um, we don't want the instant app support. So different devices run different versions of the Android system, such as Android 4.0.3 or Android 4.4. Uh, each version often adds uh, new APIs not available in the previous. So we're specifying like the minimum required SDK level you need to run this application. It declares the minimum Android version for your app. Uh, each successive version of Android provides compatibility for apps from previous ones, which means your app will always be compatible with future versions of Android that meet the minimum version requirement that you specified. So if you look here, apparently uh, running Android 4.0.3 Ice Cream Sandwich allows your device to uh, your app to run on. 100% of devices, which is quite incredible. So we'll go for that. Um, and they want us to hit next here, so make sure we're, everything is good and moving on. So now you can already see we're, uh, I don't know, as somebody who came from a couple of different IDs, uh, uh, some easier than harder, uh, some easier than others, um, <laughs> I looked at this and I got kind of excited. You know, they're, they're kind of showing you pictures of things that it just it's just a good sign so they want us to pick an empty activity ironically enough after looking and seeing oh wow look at all the cool things i can do you're just like nah let's go with the empty generic activity let's do that up so we're going to configure this activity uh we want generate layout file on this will create the layout resource connected to the activity which is yeah that sounds about right to me we're going to keep app compat on. This makes sure compatibles, the app is compatible with previous versions of Android, even if the app uses features found only in newer Android versions, which is interesting. It sounds like magic to me, but we'll find out how that works later. And they want us to create that project, so we'll just hit finish. Boom, number one, the toolbar. Um, oh, you might be on a light interface. I'm using the dark interface. I'm going to try and make my screen match the screen on the tutorial. So I'm going into my app, Java. Uh, no, I don't want that. I want res, layout, main activity. Oh, it's right there. Silly me. Turns out it is open. So we'll open that up there. Uh, there's always this issue with themes. I'm just going to pick this one because I'm partial to it. And there you go. Now we have something that vaguely matches theirs. It seems that they... Uh... Right, so let's see what we have here. Uh, toolbar. I don't think that that's my toolbar. Where is my toolbar? Yeah, oh, the toolbar is over here. This is my toolbar. Running the Android app, launching Android tools, that's what we're looking at here. Navigation bar, navigate through the project and open files for editing. I do believe that that's what we're looking at up here. Okay, you got your project pane. 
And over here, quite obviously, we do have project. We can collapse, expand that guy. It's good stuff. The editor, which I mean, go figure. You know, down here, you can switch between designing your user, your amazing Android user interface, or you can do some crazy, hello, crazy world and change it in the actual XML to have those changes reflected. So there's your editor. Uh, tabs along the left, right, and bottom of the window. You can click on tabs to open other panes. So, so they're talking about, uh, like this guy, I got my log cat, log cat is log. You got your to-do, you can build. You can do all sorts of fun stuff. Uh, those are the tabs of which they refer. The status bar along the bottom, you can see uh, Gradle build finished. Excellent. Uh, it's just going to tell you what's going on, the status of the project, and Android Studio itself, as well as any warnings or messages. Uh, you can watch the build progress in the status bar, one of my favorite things to do on a Tuesday, so that's good. Using the project pane, you can view the organization in several ways in the project pane. Uh, if it's not already selected, click the project tab. Okay, we're in there. The project pane appears to view the project in the standard Android project hierarchy. Select Android from the dropdown. That's what we appear to be on. So that's good. What else do we have? Project files. Okay. Scratches. I don't even know what a scratch is. So. Tests. Okay, yeah, so you can, uh, you can kind of break things down based on what you're doing. You can see the packages. There's my beautiful package name. Nice and unique. Lovely. Okay, we'll switch that over to Android. This chapter and other chapters refer to the project pane. When set to Android, as the project Android pane. Okay. So they're saying the project Android pane is the default. Uh, let me, uh, oh, no, no, we'll keep this up. And they are saying uh, if the Gradle scripts is, uh, folder is not expanded, let's click to expand it. So I can see that there. Boom. This folder contains all the files needed by the build system. This is like the black magic voodoo arts of your, you know, when you're getting into it, of your source files. So uh, let's explore that a little bit. That's something uh, important. The build.gradle file specifies additional libraries and the module's build configuration. So let's take a look. Oh, look at that. I have two. Okay, you can see some version, the application ID. Yep, we got uh, lovely. Just a bunch of gobbledygook to me, honestly. Even me, terrible, terrible. That's our what we're here for, though. We're gonna understand this. <clears throat> All right, so. The file also can includes a list of uh, dependencies, libraries required by the code. Mm-hmm. To view and edit the code, oh, I'll get into the good stuff. Expand the app folder, I got that up. The Java folder, and the uh, Hello World folder. Oh, okay, that was a sneeze. Mm -mm. Double click the main activity Java file to open the code editor. Done. And there it is, there's our, uh, our code. Now uh, they're also, they're gonna explain these three subfolders that we have here. So let's look at that. Um, the three subfolders, the uh, <clears throat> the hello world or the domain name you specified. Uh, that's this top one here. All the files for a package are in a folder named after the package. For your hello world app, there's one package and it contains only mainactivity.java. Then you have the Android test. Uh, you have the Android test document folder. Uh, it's for your instrumented test, and uh, it starts out with a skeleton test file, which we can take a peek at that. That uh, makes some assertions, I guess. So we'll look at testing. Uh, this folder, the next one, is for your unit tests and starts out with an automatically created skeleton unit test file. And there's our unit test. There, uh, that's kind of awesome. Checking if um, addition is correct. You expect four, the actual is two plus two. It's lovely. 
Layout files, okay. So to view and edit a layout file, expand the res folder. Expand the layout folder to see your layout file. And I uh, see we've already made some uh, some amazing modifications to this fascinating piece of uh, piece of work. Okay, resource files. Okay, so the res folder that we were just looking at it holds the resources, layout, strings, images. Um, it's going to hold your your assets, your non-code assets, uh, and even some some code, some XML. Uh, let's see here. What are the subfolders of the the res folder? Because we do have a MIP map. MIP map. Who's MIP map? You know. Let's find out what this all means. Drawable. So there's your. Uh, that's where your uh, images go. Your uh, your apps images go into that folder. Okay. The layout folder. Every activity has at least one XML layout file. That I don't believe that that's entirely true. I have some activities that don't have any XML layout files. Uh, but <laughs> very bare bones application, so I don't know if uh, I don't know if my case is always the case. <laughs> uh, up next, you got your MIP map folder. MIP map. Uh, the launcher icons are stored are stored in that folder. So there's a subfolder for each supported screen density. Android uses the number of pixels per inch to determine the required image resolution. Okay, so uh, we're gonna have to look into that, some launcher icon stuff. Uh, I did notice that they do scale very fancily, so that makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, values. Instead of hard coding things like strings, I mentioned this before, there's our app name. You can go ahead and put those in your values folder to, uh, to define that. That's something that uh, I have a couple of apps going right now that I could definitely be applying this to so lovely the values it has colors uh, dimensions so for resolution dimensions uh, strings and styles so. <sighs> using the editor pane if you select a file the editor pane appears a tab appears for the file so you can open multiple files. So we have that going on. Nothing big there. They want us to look at the uh, the XML for the activity main. There's our uh, layout editor. If you double click the main activity file in the project Android pane, the editor changes to the code editor with the tab for main activity. Again, I, this is we had all this open, but boom, you know, we're opening files. At the top of this file, they're gonna they're gonna point out you know you got a package manifest. I thought we were uh, Java undergraduates, but that's fine. Uh, followed by the import block condensed again. You know, we're Java undergraduates, remember? So this is we've got this. Uh, each activity in an app is implemented as a class, so that's what's going on there. Uh, you can see here it's extending uh, your app compat activity. Which uh, app compat I believe is what we enabled before. So this particular class of activity must be designed to uh, to be crossways compatible. Lovely. Ooh, they want us to try and understand the manifest. So let's pop that guy open. The manifest. You can find it right there. Manifest, Android manifest. Beautiful. Uh, scale up the code a little bit here, if I can. And apparently I can't. Never really thought about doing this before right now. Well, you're gonna have to gonna have to have some good eyesight, I suppose. I can't figure that out quickly enough. Ha. Huh. Alright, so what do we have? Well, you should be looking at your own manifest anyways. Before the system can start an app, uh component such as uh, an activity. The system must know that the activity exists. This is what I was talking about before. You need an index. Uh, for our lovely invisible book. Uh, it, it finds this activity by reading the app's Android manifest file. Uh, this describes all the components in your Android app. Each activity must be listed in this XML file along with all components for the app. Okay, so uh, they tell us how to do that. We've got our manifest open already. Let's take a look at it. And they're showing their manifest. My manifest has much more pretty uh, uh, the code highlights. So that's it's fancy. 
They're gonna run us through a couple of things here. So the Android manifest is coded in XML and always uses the Android namespace. So that's, we got, I think we're looking at this right here. Yeah, this scheme is bit particularly, all right. Uh, the package expression, which you're looking at right here, it shows the unique package name of the new app. Do not change the package expression after the app is published. Interesting. The application tag, with its closing application tag, defines the manifest settings for the entire app. Okay, so that's these two guys right here. There's all the settings for our entire app. Apparently, this guy sets us to allow backups. Who would guess? Uh, setting this to true enables the app to be backed up automatically and restored as needed. Users invest time and effort to configure apps. Switching to a new device can cancel out all that careful configuration. Very interesting. Okay. Beautiful. Up next, you've got our, our icon attribute right here. Okay. So it sets the, uh, the icon for the app. There's a, if we look here, there you're seeing in the red, you're seeing in the red there, the default icon, which um, I have a number of apps on my phone that have that right now as I'm just playing around. I, so that's how, that's where you would go to change that. You, you specify a MIP map as we saw before the launcher apps are contained in the MIP maps, MIP, MIP map, uh, the, within the res folder of your project. Okay, so now the uh, the app label, and you see that's South College, Hello World for me, which uh, it just actually flipped back to show me that, you know, that's actually a, I wonder how I did that. That was very interesting. It actually showed me what the value was that I'm referencing. I'm actually referencing a string, which we were looking through in our values. So the label for the app, it's not defined here as a literal, it's being referenced, or it's a reference to somewhere else. Uh, we're going to have to look into this at language. As you can see, you have the at symbol, and then you have the location in the res folder. So at, there's your res, mip map, and then they specify IC launcher. So that's how you're going to be doing that kind of stuff in, uh, within XML by the looks of it. Declaring the Android version. Uh, different devices may run different versions of the Android system. Uh, to indicate which set of APIs are available, each version specifies an API level. Okay, and I'm assuming that's somewhere in here. Oh, I don't think it is. So they actually want us to include a little bit of code. If your app can't function... Oh, okay, so they're saying if you have an app, okay, and you, you can't have it using certain uh, versions you can actually specify a hard requirement. Uh, so that's a part of this document that declaring the Android version, that's, I'm gonna leave that up to you to, to uh, review that. Uh, using the target SDK app version attribute does not prevent an app from being installed on future versions, but it will prevent it from using earlier. All right. Let's understand the build process, shall we? Um, how do you how, <laughs> how do you get your hands on an app? All right, and uh, most people at some point in their life have seen the format, the Android Application Package, the APK. Maybe not most people, but you know, uh, it's the package file format for distributing and installing Android apps. It's kind of like your EXE in Windows. I hope uh, this build process. Uh, it involves tools and process that automatically convert each process project into an APK. So we have, we got all the tools we need. We just, it's one of the tools. No, it's not. It's under the run. Uh, ooh, it's under the build, making the mistakes, build APKs. And you can sign them and do all sorts of crazy stuff with them once you become a pro. Understanding uh, the build.gradle files. Okay, so what in the world is Gradle, right? That's, I thought the first time I started to open up messing around with Java, I'm like, there's this Gradle thing. 
Well, I gotta figure it out. Android Studio uses Gradle as the foundation of the build system. Um, Android has its own plugin for Gradle. Um, Gradle's scripts, Gradle's files, these lovely things, they're automatically generated for the most part. I don't know the degree to which you have to be an expert with the Gradle, with building, with changing the configurations. Most of the changes I end up making in my applications, they are either reflected in Gradle automatically or they are not. It, there is no necessary reflection in Gradle. So we'll kind of look at this now. Let's switch back over to what's actually happening with the tutorial. Okay, so you have your build.gradle for the app. And I know I have that open. All projects, yeah, repositories, Google, JCenter. This is the top level build file for the entire project. It defines build configurations that apply to all modules in our project. And, ooh, it should not be edited to include app dependencies. If a dependency is something other than a local library or file tree, Gradle looks for the files in whichever online repositories are spe specified in the repositories block of this file. Uh, so they're kind of saying here, you shouldn't be adding anything to this file when you have dependencies uh, come up. So that's nice. That's uh, yeah, Leave it alone. Oh, good. Excellent. Thank you. Our build.gradle for the app. Pop that open. Um, so I'm looking at that file right now in mine. Uh, this creates separate build Gradle files for each module. You can edit the build settings to provide custom packaging options for each module. Uh, this is the file most often to edit when changing app level configurations. Well, that's handy to know. The dependency section. This is where we declare our dependencies. Okay. So Gradle is a domain-specific language for describing and manipulating build logic using Groovy, which is a dynamic language for the Java Virtual Machine. You don't need to learn Groovy to make changes because the Android plugin for, for Gradle uh, introduces most of the DSL elements you need. Okay. So, nice. It's, uh, it's reassuring to hear that, you know, Gradle is not going to come and uh, rob us in our sleep of all of our in entertainment and education. So that's good. Uh, yeah, they're just reviewing, reviewing, build types, build types for the app. This is getting a little heavy. I mean, we're just doing hello world here, syncing our project. When you have, when you make changes to the build configurations, Android Studio requires that you sync the project files. During the sync, Android Studio imports the build configuration changes and runs checks to make sure the configuration won't build errors won't create build errors. Uh, to sync the said project files, click sync now in the notification bar that appears when making a change. Okay. Yeah, so, and again, I mean, it's kind of awesome, but they're documenting to you right now just how easy it is if you go making changes, they're gonna say, hey, something, something's not synchronized, click the button to synchronize. Lovely, excellent. Like a true noob, we can do that. Uh, running an app on an emulator or device, that's going to be uh, some mad fun. Um, so uh, we should run that tutorial right now. Let's go ahead and do it. I'm going to pop this over. Let's get our Hello World app running. Because reasons. I've already got devices made. So I think we're going to have to uh, create a new one because you, you, we, we want to run this. We want to see what's going on. What's my dream phone? I don't know. It's the worst phone I can imagine. I wonder how it'll work with a, is this supposed to be like an Android 2.7 inch phone? Okay, let's see how it, uh, I'm a little worried. I'm a little worried that I'm gonna make a huge mistake here, but. Running, running on Oreo? All right. Why not? There's my new device. So after I added it, I get a beautiful little 
thingy. I click OK. I'm not sure what I'm looking at. Could be my app. I don't believe that it's my app. Oh, the build is still running by the looks of it. Yep. So there's our phone. <laughs> it's booting up. <laughs> I think uh, I think this is gonna work out just fine, just fine. Let's let that boot up. Oh, that's a that's adorable. Hello, crazy world. So all I had to do was just click on the play button. I just hit the play button. The thing that I uh, that I like and that can be kind of a trap is that it's very easy to get yourself started. I mean, I, we didn't even have to we didn't even have to make the hello world for this hello world application. It gave us the hello world, and that was an empty activity. I'm not even really sure how that happened. That's some black magic going on, I think. But you know, it's quick, it's easy, but we should try to understand you know uh, tools. Android Virtual Device Manager, right? That's what we want. So there's my phone. You know, I'm just going to get rid of it. Oh, it's currently running on the emulator. Whoops. Don't want to make uh, the emulator mad. There we go. I'll get rid of that. Oh, beautiful. So, uh, we just ran Hello World. That's that is literally it. This is all we have. We covered about as much as we could. Okay, so um, there are some extra elements in here. After running the the app on the virtual device, after running the app on a on a physical device, which basically amounts to plug your phone into USB, get the USB debugging. You know, Google uh, uh, Android uh, developer mode for phones. Uh, figure out your phone specific needs get USB debugging mode on plug in your phone and when you hit play it's gonna just discover that your phone's plugged in I don't I don't know if I have my do I have my phone kicking I do here so I'll plug it in and uh, since I've already done the whole developer mode thing I wish I could show it but that's fine I'm pretty sure it'll just prompt me Oh no no no! I'm sorry. I'm using the wrong. Uh, I'm using the wrong uh, USB ports for this. I don't have any on my PC, so I can't show you. But it is it is that easy. You plug it into USB. There's a guide on the tutorial which you should do yourself. I'm not a replacement for doing this. Uh, and then there's a little bit on the log. Um, the log is uh, for sending log messages to the log cap pane. Um, so I want to break that tutorial up. I, I kind of want to explore that separately from all of this. Uh, we didn't even get to dig into any real code. So we're going to be writing some code to log cat some stuff before we have anything that I don't know. We're going to, we're going to do that a slightly different way. So get your hello world up, um, get that working. Um, oh, there's more. There is much, much more. All right. Yeah, that's so. This is section one point one. Maybe we will. We'll finish off the log cat section. Let's use the log here. So let's take a look at the log cat pane. You go down, click on log cat. Beauty. I'm gonna try running my app. See what we get. See what shows up in the log cat. Cold boot it. This will just take a moment. Yeah, oh, nothing showing up in my log cat. That's interesting. Oh, probably why. There we go. So right there, that's where you select the instance of the emulator that you want to log. So I was set on that old phone that's disconnected. And here you can set uh, what your context is. Verbose here means we're looking at everything. So you can see we have a bunch of magical stuff. This is 
as far as I understand, this is all non-problematic. There's a, it's just a part of the build process. Our application, boom, hello, crazy world. So let's make the uh, the recommendation or the the changes so that uh, our hello world actually logs a message. Uh, and they say uh, use the constant in the logging statements. Log tag. Okay. So we're gonna go into the main activity. Now they say. A constant defined for the activity. So within the main activity, they want us to define a constant for the log tag. So we do a private static final string. We call it log tag. And we set that log tag to the main activity class get simple name method let's see what that does class get simple name there it is returns the simple name of the underlying class as given in the source code so if you name your class class demo I mean it's, it's literally the name of the class so when we're logging our messages, uh, and what we mean by logging our messages is um, if you got a problem in your program, you know, like this bad guy is supposed to be waiting five seconds, but he's not waiting five seconds. You need to start logging some information. Or, you know, if there's some kind of a failure that occurs, you need to log that so that you can go back to it, read it, check the status, see, was he actually waiting five seconds? What was making him trigger before he was supposed to you know and then you can find out oh the counter starts at two seconds and that's why he's not you know that's why he's not waiting five seconds he's already waited two seconds technically so we would log that so we're going to go ahead and finish up the code here uh, so we use the constant in the logging statement and uh, as soon as we set the content view here right afterwards we're going to say log dot d lowercase we're gonna toss in a ref, oh, actually, really quickly, make things easy and quick. We have a red underline here for a uh, class. It's not imported. Um, again, I feel like if you know, you're following Google's advice and you're a Java undergrad, you know this, but if you catch it early, you have a chance to hit here, alt enter, boom, you get your own import, it's easy, Simple, painless. There are other ways to do that, but uh, having something write imports for you just feels great. So we throw in the first parameter, our log tag that we just created, log underscore tag, all caps. And then we throw in the log message. And we're gonna say, hello world, because this is the most meta hello world app we've ever encountered in our lives. And um, we're just gonna run her. Let's see what happens. So I've got my device connected already. It's already connected. It's up. They see that there. So I'm just going to use that guy. Boom. And it should very quickly reopen. And I got a bunch of junk, as I always do. But if you look right here, and we have the log tag right there, I do believe. All right. So main activity it's kind of fancy so that's you, that's a pretty handy thing if you um this tagging thing is I, i'm just learning about it myself but if you know you have a you have character related things you can have a character tag and you have these other related things you can tag them and then you can search for that tag and see you know because i bet you i bet you log cats get insane if you allow them to just it, it's already insane when you just run the hello world app, you know, so organization matters. It's going to matter a lot. Now, let's let's take a look at our tutorial here for one one. I don't even know. We're at the end of the thing. Here's the message that we just saw. 
And this is the end of the your first Android app section. Let's see here. Yeah, so that's the end of the section. Um, this is what like you should be able to do all of those steps right up to the log cat. Make sure you can find the log cat. Make sure you're running. Do the phone. Run it on your phone. Get it all down. Take a look at the document again. And you, you, we have this um, uh, this idea of you know from the first section here. No, maybe it was from the second lecture, 1.1. Oh, it might have been the PowerPoint. I just don't want to misspeak here, and that's all I'm waiting for. Because you have, you know, you, it's like you have your res, your assets, and then you have your activities, right? Your views, your activities, uh, and your uh, components, uh, resources, components, manifest. Okay, your resources, your components, your manifest, all right? Uh, resources contain some code. There's still XML in there. That's the mix-up that I'm, I was trying to avoid is that... You know, your user interfaces, they're mostly code, but you design them. They are uh, something that your components are going to be accessing, displaying, inflating, that kind of a thing. The manifest, holding it all together, right? You Telling you where you want to go first. What's, uh, what's our first order of business? And then you've got your build configuration, which is the black magic that one day we all strive to understand. Uh, Unless you really are a Java undergraduate, in which case you're probably smarter than me and this tutorial. So that's the end. Have an incredible day. Good luck. Have fun. Don't die. Um, let me know if you got any problems. I'm sure there's some way to contact. I will try to answer questions. Yep. Yeah.